Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I feel I ought to begin by uh, uh, apologising in case any of you came here expecting that I would be talking about surface craft. And I dare say some of you may have come in that belief. What I'm actually going to be talking about to a large extent is aircraft. But before I get to the aircraft specifically, uh, Loch Ney, as, as I imagine everybody knows, the largest inland lake in the British Isles, and yet it's a comparatively small body of water, about 20 miles by 9 approximately, as far as I'm aware. And yet, over a period of some 26 years, from 1922 until 1948, at least 13 aircraft that I'm aware of crashed into that lake, parts of them, and at least one or two complete aircraft are still there, but the vast majority were eventually recovered. I should also say that as well as the 13 aircraft that crashed into the lake, that resulted in 11 deaths of the personnel involved. So a tragic situation, I suppose it's fair to say. Now the question arises then, why? Why 13 aircraft in such a comparatively small area? Well, there were two main factors. Airfields, of course. During the Second World War, uh, Northern Ireland had 25 airfields. But our airfield history goes right back to the First World War, as depicted in that particular illustration. Uh, the, main air, the main airfield, of course, of that period being Alder Grove, which was constructed just as the First World War was ending. Um, I didn't go into the uh, precise history of Alder Grove because that's really not the point of my talk this afternoon, but of course, as we'll see as I go on, aircraft operating from Alder Grove, and there were other aspects of Alder Grove's history which are part and parcel of this particular uh, factor that was involved in so many aircraft ending up in the log. That was the early period, I'll say no more about that. Just prior to the outbreak of the Second World War, there were only three airfields, three airfields, so to speak, that were actually being used as such. And there they are, all the groves still very much in existence. Two others which had originated as civil airports, uh, the first one being Newtonards, 1934, and then in 1938, followed by Sydenham. Uh, both those airfields, of course, shortly after the outbreak of war were requisitioned. But in the meantime, all the groves, uh, was the maid of all work, so to speak, and a huge amount of activity um, was taking place at Alder Grove from the beginning of the war, actually. During the war itself, the three um, previous airfields were joined by uh, considerably more, another 22 in fact. They came about in two phases of development, and I won't spend a huge amount of time, I'm certainly not talking about them uh, individually, but those airfields were created to accommodate fighter squadrons, coastal command squadrons for the war against the U-boats, probably Northern Ireland's most important contribution to the Second World War, the war against the U-boats. But of course there were airfields there for other purposes, to store aircraft for example, um, until such times as they could be brought to Aldergrove for work to be done on them to prepare them for military service, and I'm talking essentially about new aircraft that were being produced in huge numbers by the uh, factories, of course. Um, another uh, purpose of some of the airfields was to accommodate Army Cooperation Squadrons, and I'm referring specifically to uh, Sydenham and Long Cache and McGabry, because at one time, of course, uh, plans were drawn up against the possibility that Northern Ireland might be invaded, as indeed plans were drawn up in the event that the United Kingdom as a whole might be invaded. Uh, and to that end, airfields were identified here in the form of Long Cache and McGabry and Sydney to accommodate Army Cooperation Squadrons in the event that there had to be a counter-attack across the border. It never occurred, of course, but anyway, just another aspect of what the airfields were created for. As the war developed, of course, despite the original purpose, uh, some of the airfields, quite a lot of them, in fact, probably most of them, uh, had to be used for other purposes, but that's another story. The final phase of development is illustrated there, and I suppose one word could sum up how these particular airfields came to be used, and the word is training. 
because of course as the war developed, the Royal Air Force and Fleet Air Arm grew in strength, uh, and indeed as the Americans came and uh, occupied bases here for one purpose or another, so there was a concomitant need for training, and that's basically what the airfields you see in that diagram uh, were created uh, to serve. There was another factor, of course, and to say a little bit more about that one, I go back to 1929. In fact, I go back to 1925, because in May 1925, a very significant development occurred here in Northern Ireland, and that was the formation of a Royal Air Force Special Reserve Squadron, number 502. It was a number, it was one of uh, 21 Special Reserve and Auxiliary Air Force Squadrons that were formed in the United Kingdom, beginning with number 502 squadron in May 1925. It was the first of the Special Reserve Squadrons to be formed in the UK, to be formed at Aldergrove. Now it was a night bombing squadron originally, and obviously as a bombing squadron, it had to have facilities for practice bombing. Interestingly, the targets that were created specifically for that purpose were established on Loch Ness itself in the form of floating targets, of course. They were constructed, it would appear, in GB. They were brought across to Belfast. They were brought to Loch Ness via the lagging navigation. And they were established on the Loch in July 1929 just off Ardmore Point, which is the uh, prominence that you see sticking out into Loch Ness in that photograph, and just beyond the prominence itself, in the Loch, you can see a line of targets. It was there that the first floating targets to be created on Loch Ness uh, were established. The photograph, by the way, wasn't taken in 1929, it was taken during the Second World War, but the tar targets, the initial targets on the Loch were established where you see them. They led on, beginning in 1936, when an armament training camp, as it was known, was established at Aldergrove. It was operated, the targets which were part and parcel of the armament training facilities, and which consisted of various types of target bombing and gunnery ranges. Uh, you see them illustrated there. Uh, I'm sorry that the they are identified in writing, which is probably impossible to read uh, from where you're sitting. But again, really, essentially for the purposes of what I want to talk about, uh, it's not all that important that you establish exactly what each target was there for. Um, you'll also notice, by the way, two uh, dotted lines running north south. It was along those tracks, so to speak, that aircraft would have towed drogue targets as they were known. In other words, this was just like a big sausage at the end of a cable which was dragged backwards and forwards by specific aircraft to facilitate the training of air gunners. As well, of course, as the targets floating on the lock itself, which were there for dive bombing or high-level bombing or bombing and gunnery practice of one kind or another. So, naturally, there was a huge amount, for one reason or another, associated with the airfields and associated directly with Loch Ness itself. Uh, and I suppose that uh, is the really significant background to how 13 aircraft, uh, actually during the Second World War itself, 10 aircraft went into the Loch. The others went in either uh, before, well before the outbreak of the Second World War, or in one case just after it but I'll come to that in a moment or two. Now, as I said at the very beginning, most of the aircraft that went into the lock were actually recovered sooner or later. So the question arises then, how were they recovered? And that brings me to the particular gentleman that you see, second left, wearing the suit and the hat, and if I achieve anything this afternoon, I hope in fact I bring to a wider attention than has been appreciated to date, the little known activities of this man and the small company that he created. Second left is a gentleman called Henry McGarry. It was Henry McGarry 
who initially was a simple fisherman in Loch May, who was approached by the Air Ministry to facilitate the maintenance of the target systems that were created on the loch. But of course as time developed, he wasn't just responsible <coughs> for maintaining the target systems of one kind or another. He and the team of people that he built up as part of his small company were also engaged to recover the aircraft that I'll be speaking about. That photograph was taken at his boatyard, and for those of you who know Loch Ness, uh, that boatyard exists still, albeit uh, it is no longer used as such to the best of my knowledge, but it was there at close to Ardmore Point where Henry McGarry set up and developed his business, and that photograph was taken actually in 1948, just after the war ended. Uh, during the war, he was assisted by his two teenage sons, and I'll be quoting from um, a statement which one of those sons, the late Jim McGarry, uh, made, uh, which is very, very interesting, as I'm sure you'll agree when I come to read it out. It was at Ardmore Point again, just to come back to Loch Ness, and those of you who are to some extent or other familiar with it, it was at Ardmore that the boat the made of Antrim would have been based uh, and it's from that point in fact where during the uh, 60s, 70s and 80s that people would on occasion have gone and been taken out on the loch by Jim and George McGarry, Jim's brother. So that will give you an idea of um, where we're talking about. <coughs> I'll come back to uh, the circumstances of how that aircraft came to end up at McGarry's boatyard in due course. But let's just take a, a close look at some of the uh, items of equipment which the McGarry's used for the purposes that I've just been talking about. That salvage barge was central to their work. It's about 50 foot, or it was, because I think it no longer exists, it was about 50 foot in length and probably no more than 18 or maximum 20 feet in width. I've got a slightly more revealing photograph of it. There's a front view of it. And you'll notice the various items of equipment on the deck. Uh, there's a derrick there, there's a small crane, there was a compressor to uh, provide air for the divers which the McGarry organization naturally had to use. And speaking of which, in fact, let's just go and have a look at one of the two divers which the McGarry organization employed in the course of their work. They were brothers, Joe, who's the one pictured, and Charlie McGee. Charlie McGee, in fact, is to the left as you look at the photograph. And amazing as it might seem, that was the nature of the equipment that the divers back then had to use. It's a canvas waterproof suit, a copper helmet which you can see just about to be placed on Joe's head, and a collar arrangement to which the uh, copper helmet was actually screwed. You note also the big heavy lead boots, because the way that aircraft that had gone to the bottom of the lake were recovered and unfortunately I wish I wish I, uh, I wish film had been made of this operation because it would really be the, the most um, the best way to illustrate it's very very difficult on my part certainly I've never been a diver of any kind but every time I think about this operation I'm just amazed the diver, when the barge would have gone out to recover an aircraft, the diver, of course, would have suited up. He would have been lowered over the side of the barge, obviously suspended, um, well, not suspended, but with airlines attached to him, through which, of course, the air that was necessary naturally to keep him alive was pumped. He would have not hauled his way down, but he would have 
used a rope that would have been lowered off the barge with a weight on the end of it, of course, so it would remain vertical. And he would have eventually gone down that rope to the bottom of the lake itself. Now, divers assure me that Loch Ney, unlike the marine environment as such, Loch Ney is almost always full of sediment so that it's virtually impossible to see your hand in front of your face. So just try and imagine Joe or Charlie McGee going to the bottom of the rope. They would also have had another rope attached to them, the other end of which would have been attached to the rope that I've just mentioned that would have been lowered with a huge weight on the end. And the way that they would have operated to find these aircraft was once they got on the bottom, they would then have walked out in any direction at all. It didn't really matter. They would have walked out until the rope that was attaching them to the vertical rope would have gone taut. Then they would have started, unless, of course, in the meantime, by walking out, they might, and I imagine this didn't happen very often, but unless in the meantime they had bumped into the wreck of the aircraft on their way out, they would then have described a huge circle in the hope that they would eventually bump into the aircraft or equally in the hope that between where they were and the other end of the rope it would snag the aircraft. If they didn't succeed, well then they would simply move the barge and do the same thing again until eventually they found the aircraft. It seems amazing now, but that is how I understand uh, was the mode of operation. And I have that information from Joe Mimi himself, whom I met quite a number of years ago. Sadly, neither he nor Charlie uh, are alive. So that was basically, and very crudely described, uh, that was the basic mode of operation to get these aircraft out. So let's move on then to some of the aircraft themselves. <coughs> <coughs> the first incident of this kind occurred in the 9th of September 1922. The aircraft that you see in that picture is not the aircraft involved. It's just there to illustrate the type of aircraft. It's a Bristol F-2B fighter. The date is significant. This obviously followed partition. The Royal Air Force, which previously of course had been an all-Ireland organisation so to speak, by now, had taken up residence in Northern Ireland, but was still in the process of um, moving things like records and uh, equipment and so on. So on the 9th of September 1922, one of these aircraft left Aldergrove en route to Phoenix Park in Dublin with mail and also, it so happened, the commanding officer of the squadron operating these aircraft that was then at Autogrove, a wing commander, Bettington. Sadly, when the aircraft was about eight miles from Autogrove, uh, which would have been approximately five miles off the eastern shore of Loch Ney, I don't know exactly where, the aircraft had an engine failure and went into the loch. Fortunately, the two on board, the pilot, and the wing commander, uh, although somewhat injured, um, physically and no doubt in pride as well, survived. They were retrieved on the surface clinging to some wreckage by local fishermen. So this particular incident did not result in any death. To the best of my knowledge, the aircraft in this case is still there. I certainly haven't come across any records whatsoever to indicate that it was eventually brought out. So, 9th of September 1922, the first incident of its kind that I'm aware of. The next one occurred, as you can see from the date, on the 18th of May 1931. I'm sorry I didn't have a decent photograph of the aircraft type itself. It was a type known as a Hopper Horsley, a light bomber aircraft. Now, by this stage, 1931, the target system that I've already referred to, and the first of which had been laid in 1929, they were very much in the course of development. 
And that was really the main purpose of the aircraft being over Loch Ness itself. However, in this case, records would indicate that the pilot on board, and there was only one pilot on board despite the fact that this was a two a crew aircraft, there was only one pilot on board, and for some reason or other, which no records exist to explain, he wasn't, he wasn't just confining himself to attacking the targets as such, he decided to dive bomb a couple of fishing boats which were on the lock at the time. And when I say dive bomb, I mean in inverted commas. Sadly, it was in the course of carrying out such foolhardy um, uh, attacks, so to speak, he actually hit the mast of one of the fishing boats and in the process killed one of the fishermen on board, a young man, local man, called Hannan, who according to records uh, was a well-known inter-provincial hockey player at the time. So that, again to the best of my knowledge, was the first instance of a death resulting from an aircraft going into the rock. The pilot was injured and in fact was eventually court-martialed, given what he was doing at the time. Whether or not the aircraft was recovered, again, I have not come across records to explain that one way or the other. It's possible that the aircraft was recovered in that case because I do have a photograph, a very poor photograph, otherwise it would have been up here, showing the aircraft floating on the surface of the lock some time after uh, the occurrence that I've just mentioned. So it's quite possible that uh, that, that particular aircraft did remain floating and if so would probably or possibly have been dragged to shore but not sure about that one. The next incident occurred early in the uh, Second World War itself and involved initially one hurricane and then sometime afterwards another two. By this time, by 1940, the summer of 1940, a hurricane squadron had been sent to Northern Ireland for the defence of the country. Uh, fighter Command Squadron, uh, operating hurricanes as I've just said. Again, none of the aircraft you see in that picture were the hurricanes actually involved. But, let me just check the, the date. Yes, on the 21st of October 1940, <coughs> one of the squadron's hurricanes was over the loch when it inexplicably dived into the lock, killing the pilot. And apparently it went in, it was, a, it was seen to go in at very high speed. Uh, and in the process, of course, would have ended up totally destroyed. The pilot, as I've said, was killed. Sadly, he was not recovered. So that was the first uh, occurrence of a hurricane going into the lock. And the date was 21st of October 1940, as I've said. That was followed then on the 30th of April 1941 by the second incident also involving hurricanes from the same squadron. In this case, two were over the loch as it happened, practiced dogfighting. Sadly, they collided and again went into the loch, killing both pilots in that particular occasion. Again, one of those pilots was not recovered. The other one, uh, a chap called Pilfold, um, was actually recovered and was taken back to Britain to be buried in Buckinghamshire. Now, again, there's some doubt as to what extent wreckage from these aircraft was recovered. Some wreckage certainly was recovered. Uh, the two Merlin engines, for example, from, or I should say, two Merlin engines from two of the aircraft were eventually recovered by the Nagaris, as was some wreckage. How much uh, is not clear. Uh, I was just about to say from the records, but that brings me just to one point I forgot to mention earlier on. I would be in a better position to uh, give a lot more information about these incidents were it not for the fact that sometime after the war, the records, which of course 
the Bengali organization kept meticulously being under contract to the Air Ministry. They had to do that. But in the early 1970s, following the closure of Royal Air Force Bally Kelly, some gentlemen arrived from Bally Kelly, from the Royal Air Force, armed with a letter from the Air Ministry, which instructed Jim McGarry, his father having died by that stage, which instructed Jim McGarry to hand over his records or the company's records, which allegedly were going to the RAF Museum in London. They never got there. And the reason why they never got there is unknown, certainly. I have no idea. I have searched diligently, I have talked to numerous people, but I have no idea at all where the McGarry records ended up, which is sad in the extreme, given the nature of the work that they were doing, and of course, which I've still got to talk about as we go on. So in other words, while I'm certainly, uh, because Jim McGarry himself was the man who told me, uh, the two Merlin engines were recovered after these incidents and bits and pieces of wreckage, but to what extent uh, the record doesn't exist to explain. Uh, presumably, hopefully it exists somewhere, but certainly I've never seen it. Anyway, just to move on. The next incident occurred on the 20th of September 1941 and involved one of these aircraft, a Bristol Blenheim. In this case, uh, the aircraft was a fighter version of the Blenheim. The Blenheim was originally designed, or well, some Blenheims uh, were used as bomber aircraft, light to medium bomber aircraft, but others, such as the type we're talking about, were long-range fighters used by coastal command. And this was the case in this particular incident. The squadron was number 254 squadron, which was based at Aldergrove. And the background to this particular uh, episode is that the aircraft was over Loch Ney uh, being um, used for low-level diving bombing practice. The Loch at the time, apparently, according to the record, it was a very, very calm day. The water was still. And apparently, and this factor, according to the records, explained several of the incidents that I'll be going on to talk about. Apparently in such conditions, when the surface is more or less uh, unruffled and it's flat calm, it's extremely difficult, if you're in an aircraft operating low level, it's very difficult to distinguish the surface of the water from the horizon in certain cases. And uh, it was that uh, particular phenomenon that uh, was attributed as the cause of this particular aircraft going into the lake. Uh, again, I, uh, all I know is it was several miles off Gartree Point, which is a little bit to the south of Ardmore Point that we saw earlier. There were three crew on board. All of them were killed when the aircraft went in. In this case, though, the bodies were eventually recovered. Not immediately. It took some days for them to be recovered. And eventually the wreckage was also recovered. And that brings me just to another aspect of the McGarry uh, operations, which I haven't so far mentioned. And that is the divers' experience when they would have been uh, operating at the bottom of the lake in a circumstance such as this. I well remember Joe McGee telling me in one of my interviews with him that he would never forget his first experience of finding an aircraft with dead bodies inside and eventually going into the aircraft to recover them. Uh, an unimaginable situation, certainly I find it very hard to imagine. And it must have been, it must have been, I mean, people talk about post traumatic stress disorder. I imagine, I imagine the Gary divers, well, I don't know obviously whether they suffered from that or not, but it must have been a pretty horrific business. Anyway, in this particular case, as I said, three crew killed, all of whom were recovered, and are buried, in fact, in St. Catherine's churchyard at Kilit, in Aldergrove itself. And the aircraft wreckage was also eventually recovered. The next type involved was one of these, a Wellington bomber, 20th of May 1942. 
at that time, the squadron that this particular aircraft operated with, which was a, one of the Czech squadrons of the Royal Air Force, uh, in Coastal Command, number 311 squadron. It was on its way back to Aldergrove, over Loch Ney, when one of the engines failed. The aircraft was ditched successfully in the lake. There it is. Everyone got out, injured somewhat, but at least everyone got out. Uh, the aircraft sank, was brought to the surface. And that brings me to another aspect of the Gary operation, which again I've uh, forgotten to mention so far. It's very difficult to see in that particular photograph, but the method of bringing aircraft, um, which are pretty large and heavy objects, as you might imagine, the method of bringing those to the surface was for the divers to go down with what they would have referred to as camels. C-A-M-E-L-S, don't ask me why they used that term, but a camel to the diver was in effect a large airbag. Again, canvas by nature, but uh, it was capable of being pumped full of air, and provided you had a large enough camel, or in fact several camels, uh, in cases such as this, attached firmly to the aircraft, they were pumped full of air, and that's how they aircraft was brought to the surface. In this case the camels would appear to be underneath uh, the wings. Uh, we'll come to another photograph later on where they were attached uh, in another place. But anyway, that was the basic method of bringing an aircraft like this to the surface and obviously towing it uh, to shore. Moving on then to 2nd of April 1943 and 28th of May 1943. Two of these, Beaufort aircraft, again produced by the same company as the Blenheim. But in the case of the Beaufort, the Beaufort was uh, a torpedo bomber and what was known as a general reconnaissance aircraft. In other words, they tended to be used by Royal Air Force Coastal Command. Now, in 1943 and during pretty well the whole of 1943, there was a Coastal Command Operational Training Unit based at Longkesh and also McGabra airfields. And that's where the two Beaufort aircraft that went into the lock on the dates that you see there were operating from. On the one on the 2nd of April 1943, um, it again was carrying out low level exercises when for one reason or another it went into the lake. All three crew on board were killed. Uh, let me see if they were... Yes, eventually in this case as well, all three bodies were recovered by the McGarry organization. Um, and taken again to Great Britain for a burial. The second incident on the 28th of May 1943 occurred in roughly similar circumstances. In other words, the aircraft was on the targets at low level when it went into the loch. And again, this phenomenon of not being able to distinguish readily um, how high above the surface of the water you were in calm conditions would appear to have been a factor. We come now to the 12th of May 1943, which in my case is a very easy date to remember because it so happens I was one year old then. <laughs> now that's not the aircraft, or I should say the flying boat, that's not the flying boat that was involved, but it was a Sunderland flying boat nevertheless. That photograph was taken at Queen's Island just after the aircraft has gone down the ramp on beaching gear and is obviously floating on Belfast Loch at the time the photo was taken. But on the 12th of May 1943, it actually flew in to Loch Ney. Um, there was on Loch Ney, and I didn't specifically mention it at the very beginning, but at Sandy Bay on the eastern shore of the loch, a flying boat moorings facility was created. And the reason for creating a flying boat moorings facility was simply to facilitate 
the flying boats of the Royal Air Force that would have been using the target systems from time to time. And that's exactly why this particular why the particular flying boat that was involved in this incident on the 12th of May was at Lochney. It was from a Norwegian squadron of the Royal Air Force, number 330. And whether to refuel or not, I don't know, but in any event, when it arrived, the crew decided that they would alight on the loch, perhaps to refuel, I'm not just guessing there. But in the process of touching down on the loch, uh, they may have hit floating debris, but in any event, the hull was damaged enough for the boat to sink. And let me move on to, there you are. That photograph was taken a very, only a matter of days after the boat sank at Sandy Bay. When that photograph was taken, it has been brought to the surface by the garage. You can see the barge there with the derrick on board. Um, I don't think it well. It would have been brought to the surface by the means I mentioned earlier by the camels, although I'm looking in vain to see if I can see any. In any event, the interesting thing is that when the Megaris were actually working here, believe it or not, another incident occurred. But let me come back to that in just a minute or two. Before I do, let me move on. What you see there is the hull of the flying boat that was in the previous picture. Because the Megaris succeeded in bringing that flying boat on shore, taking the wings off, so that they and the hull itself could be brought to Sydenham, Belfast, ostensibly to be repaired because the boat wasn't terribly badly damaged. However, having brought it to uh, Sydenham to the Civil Repair Organisation at Short and Harland, the decision was taken to write it off. Interestingly, just to digress a little bit from the main uh, subject of my talk, if you look to the left, you'll see that mobile crane has got the letters LOC on it. Those letters stand for Lockheed Overseas Corporation because to a considerable extent in relation to the work that they were doing, uh, the McGarry's worked in association with the Americans at Langford Lodge and indeed uh, at Belfast Harbour itself. And it just so happens that that mobile crane you see there which was obviously involved in uh, offloading the, uh, the hull uh, was provided by the Americans. But as I was saying, while the McGarry's were actually on the lock itself, recovering in the process of recovering the Sunderland, one of these aircraft happened to be flying past, not this particular one, it's a Tiger Moth. And as you can see, the date was the 17th of May, five days after the Sunderland actually sank at Sandy Bay. This aircraft was flying past, and obviously the crew on board, there were two crew on board, they were, I presume, fascinated by what was going on in the lock and decided to go in and have a look. Now, I'm sure you're ahead of me, and know what I'm going to say, but at this point, let me just read a statement which Jim McGarry, one of Henry McGarry's uh, sons, who was only a teenager at the time I'm talking about, but who actually made this statement some time afterwards. Let me just read it to you. Some accidents were as a result of very calm, mirror-like conditions on the log surface, causing miscalculation of height above water, particularly when pulling out of a dive maneuver during imitation dogfight exercises. One of these instances happened within 500 yards of where we were salvaging a Sunderland flying boat near Rams Island in May 1943. A small Tiger Moth aircraft on its way to a distant airfield with some tools came down to have a closer look at our operation on this hot and dead calm day and gently flew straight into the loch, having lost concentration above the mirror surface. A dash by our crew in an attendant boat secured the two crew members who were taken ashore immediately. The salvage barge was released from the Sunderland and taken over to the new crash site where Charlie McGee, the resident diver, 
donned his heavy canvas suit, copper helmet, and lead weighted boots and secured the living crane sling, sorry, and secured the lifting crane sling to the propeller boss in thirty feet of water. When the moth was winched to well above water level, the barge proceeded ashore, carrying it like a tiger carries its cub. After leaving the salvage job, sorry, after leaving the moth on shore, there was sufficient daylight left to return to the Sunderland salvage job and carry on working. Such was the trend during those war years. The job in hand had to be completed in good weather conditions, regardless of hours worked, and 36 hours at a stretch was not uncommon. Again, gives you some idea of the work that the McGarry organization carried out, and for which, for which in fact, in my opinion anyway, they got far, far less than the recognition they deserved. Which brings me then just to the final incident involving one of these aircraft. You saw it, in fact, almost at the very beginning of my talk. A Halifax bomber aircraft as designed, but in this case, the aircraft was part and parcel of a 202 Meteorological Squadron based at Aldergrove at the time. Now, these aircraft, of course, Right up until 1963, when the Met Squadron at Oligo was disbanded, these aircraft day and daily, or at least aircraft operated by the squadron because they didn't just operate by Halifax, um, but day and daily, one of their aircraft would have gone out over the Atlantic gathering data for obviously weather forecasting purposes. However, on the 23rd of April 1948, this particular one, not the one picked again, I should say, but one of them had been serviced and was up on an air test when suddenly uh, it developed uh, a runaway propeller on one of the engines and the engine as a result began to overspeed. That was a potentially catastrophic situation but fortunately the pilot decided immediately to ditch the aircraft before the propeller would actually have flung itself off the engine and had it entered the fuselage of the aircraft, of course, it would have resulted in a total catastrophe. He managed to ditch the aircraft in the lake. And there it is, after it had been brought to the surface, once again, by the McGarry's. You'll notice in the background the barge. And if you look just forward of the left wing, You can see one of the camels that I was talking about earlier. It was roped to one of the engines. There were a couple of others, which I don't have a photograph, on the opposite side, also uh, tied to the engines, and pumped full of air again. The Halifax then was brought to the surface and brought to shore, which you saw. And in fact, let me just go back to it. There it is, ended up on shore, damaged obviously, but fortunately once again all the crew got out and there would have been seven crew normally on this aircraft, although I don't think there were seven on in the circumstances given it was on an air test. Anyway, that brings me to the end of my talk. I hope you found it of some interest. I think we may have time for any questions if there are any, but thanks very much for your patience. Thank you.